Okay, and welcome today. We're here with anthropologist David Price, uh, who does a lot of research on military and surveillance, and a real quick biography here. Uh, David Price is a professor of anthropology at St. Martin's University in Lacey, Washington. He's conducted cultural, anthropological, and archaeological fieldwork and research in the United States, Palestine, Egypt, and Yemen. He received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Florida in 1993. He has a three-volume series of books using documents released under the Freedom of Information Act and archival sources to examine American Anthropologist inter Interactions with Intelligence Agen Agency. He has a number of books, uh, including Threatening Anthropology. Um, uh, sorry, there's, there's, so, there's such a long list of your books here. Um, uh, Weaponizing Anthropology, uh, and coming up uh, very soon here in the fall, The American Surveillance State, How the U.S. Spies on Descent Will Be uh, 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 how U.S. Spies Dies on Descent, uh, and that will be published by the Pluto Press in the fall of 2021. So, so uh, I just, uh, first of all, I want to say your work is, is wonderful and really important, uh, and I, I love the, the very interesting critique you provide um, that uh, helps us to really, um, uh, to really kind of understand the complexity of war, social science, and how that's been weaponized. Because, you know, for those uh, who may not know, who are watching, who don't know a lot about anthropology, uh, one of the important things that I think it's important for us to all recognize is that anthropology was really invented as a colonial tool of power originally. It, the discipline itself has largely changed, of course, um, but there's still kind of like shades of going back to that those old days with a lot of the the new integration of military and intelligence systems with social science so uh david the first question i want to ask you here is um so in your book weaponizing anthropology um you really do open that that kind of discussion about how anthropology was historically a tool of power so so what did this look like in the early days of social science and then how does it kind of relate to what's going on now First, thanks for having me, Michael. This is a this is a real pleasure. Uh, yeah, in, in weaponizing anthropology, I uh, you know I opened with an essay or a chapter titled something like you know war is a force that gives anthropology ethics, uh, and I talk about this sort of early colonial history where anthropologists in the United States, uh, anthropologists from Europe, uh, working in Asia and Africa. Uh, here in the United States, you know, primarily working with native indigenous populations, uh, there's this colonial history of needing somebody to study the other, uh, someone who can make legible or make understandable these populations uh, that are that are out there. And a lot of this anthropology, I think of as being sort of dual use, with the, with the idea being. Uh, there's, you know, there's this notion that comes from the physical sciences, biology, chemistry, and so on, that uh, there are dual uses for things that we study. So someone who's a vi virologist, somebody studying viruses, um, in some level, there needs to be some awareness that these things can be weaponized. And there are protocols uh, in the physical sciences for, for dealing with this. And so with that dual use idea, um, you know, my take on looking at these early anthropologists or early people who were interested in studying uh, the first peoples here in the United States, studying native populations, uh, they may have had very sincere interests in studying different cultures for its own right as in terms of equality and things like that. But the, the context in which the knowledge is produced uh, if there's a, a settler colonialism project or a military project going on at the same time, um, there are often historically there have been these different uses for the the sort of information that's that's gathered. So uh, even without intent, a lot of this knowledge can wind up being commercialized or weaponized or used in really really different sort of ways. And that's uh, you know for the last few decades I've I've that's been an interest and focus of, of my research. 
Yeah, and it sounds like you, you've spent a lot of time combing through all these historical documents, you know, with the Freedom of Information Act and, you know, reading your books, it's just the amount of available information you have to sift through. And I know at one point in one of your uh, one of your books, you talk about how like there is just unindexed, declassified smorgasbord of stuff and 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 you know so you're you're sifting through thousands and thousands of pages of documents and it's just uh, you know it, it, the 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 amount of effort that you put in here is monumental and i do think it's it's kind of a public service to really kind of expand you know a lot of what this stuff has been going on because the average person is doesn't have the time or the ability to sit here and comb through all these intelligence reports and declassified documents and all that other kind of stuff so really appreciate that you spend so much of your time and energy doing that so um and then one thing you mentioned at one point in weaponizing anthropology is uh franz boaz's famous 1919 article scientists as spies and how he was censured for that. Um, so it's so it's obvious that even in the early 20th century, anthropologists were already critical of the war effort. But then, you know, you turn around, you see someone like uh, Margaret Mead or Ruth Benedict actually participating in the Second World War effort. So, so what are your thoughts on, on those kinds of things? Yeah, the, uh, the Boaz letter, I see as a really sort of crucial moment early on in anthropology, uh, because, you know, this is this is decades before the first ethics codes uh, are, are put together. It's really not until after World War II uh, that that research ethics in general, which are in largely based on the Nuremberg Code, uh, come into existence much less anthropological codes, which the first ones, uh, the first ethics code for anthropologists are applied anthropologists, just because after the war, they started really thinking about what they'd done in the Second World War, and it raised those sorts of issues. So academic anthropologists through the American Anthro Association, it's, it's, it's not until Vietnam, late in Vietnam, that they, they, start, they start dealing with these issues. So the, the Boaz piece, uh, you know, he writes this letter, 1919, to the nation, where he says there are four anthropologists who he won't even name uh, that he knows, he says, were engaging in espionage and that this is wrong. He says they prostituted science uh, and and makes also sort of, uh, I don't know, utilitarian arguments saying things like, if people are going to do this, we're not going to be welcome to go out and do field work. And just a few weeks later, after publishing this this letter to the editor in The Nation, um, he's censured. Uh, I think he's the only anthropologist ever to be censured by the American Anthropological Association uh, for 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 writing this letter. Uh, and you know, due to the 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 great historical research by George Stocking, a historian of of anthropology. Um, you know, there, there, there are good analyses out there that that say, and Stocking wrote a piece in uh, like 1968 or something like that, where where he says, look, the, these meetings were held in uh, Harvard's backyard. There was always animosity between Harvard and Columbia, Harvard and Boas. Uh, you know, frankly, because there's this racist nonsense uh, going on at Harvard. They're, they they've racialized anthropology in these horrible ways, and Boas is fighting this. And so Stocking makes this argument that um, this was pre-existing animosity and things like that. And that uh, some of these anthropologists, turns out all of them had Harvard, the, of these four anthropologists had Harvard connections. So uh, long story short, um, I, I studied with George Stocking uh, in, the, in the 1980s in grad school. And I asked him, I said, how come you don't name uh, how come you didn't name who these anthropologists were, who these these four anthropologists that Boaz accused? Do you know who they were? And he said, yeah, I think I know. He goes, well, it was too soon. So he wrote that, I'm going to say in like 1968. That's 50 years later. Um, so there was this hesitancy to, to really talk about it, you know, something that's still sensitive 50 years later. And when I started working on anthropologists in the Second World War, uh, 
uh, it was more like 40 years later when I first started doing it. And I started getting the same sort of vibrations of like, you know, uh, it's complicated because I started looking at anthropologists that were working in the internment camps, the war relocation uh, authority camps that locked up Japanese Americans. Um, and there was this definitely, you don't want to do this, it's too soon uh, to be talking about these sorts of things, uh, which just made it more interesting for me and, you know, made me made me interested in, in jumping in. So, you know, war, uh, there's always been war in the background of anthropological war or occupation or colonialism. And it's really not until the 70s that first colonialism starts to be, uh, you know, a topic that's that's really being addressed, not even by everyone and certainly uh, not, you know, full on. Uh, and then warfare and all these things just really in the 70s bring this this stuff to a head. And then it kind of just goes away into this stuff to a head. And then it kind of just goes away into the background, which which made me more interested in 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 doing what I could uh, to dig through these archives to find these things or or to use the Freedom of Information Act. And one of the nice things about the Freedom of Information Act, well, it's actually the worst thing about the Freedom of Information Act is it, it takes a long time. If you, if you request an FBI file, you may never get it. They may lie to you and say they don't have it. And you have to, or they're lazy and they didn't look and you do appeals and, and finally get it. But, it, you know, it can take nine months to six years uh, to get files. And so uh, that's the worst thing uh, is that you have to wait. But uh, in some sense, it made it easy for me because um, I, when I started doing this work, I've always had a really heavy teaching load. I, uh, you know, teach at an institution that forever was a four, four load. Uh, there's really no time for research. This isn't really fundable research uh, I found early on. Uh, but I just write a letter, send it off, and later these files would come, and at my leisure, you know, I could I could read these things. So it it took a long time, uh, but in some sense, the curse of freedom of information that it takes so damn long, it it had its own pace and made it easy to to do this, to read the files, to think about them, to start writing notes. It's it's a it was a slow boil, not a not a quick boil in terms of working on these things. Well, that's really not much different from like classic ethnography either, right? I mean, so, you know, and this is one of the big problems of the, the human terrain system, which I'll ask about here in just a moment, but um, is that they want these kind of quick turnarounds for ethnographic information and they want, you know, rapid ethnographic assessment models and all this other kind of stuff. But the reality is, I mean, if you just think about any kind of relationship or friendship, it takes you a while to really know. And that's, and that's in a situation where you're familiar, but I just, um, also wanted to comment too. I, I love that it's the applied anthropologists that are the first ones who really start to ask the ethical questions in the post-war period, because you so often hear as an anthropologist and, and people who aren't in anthropology don't know this, but there's kind of a little bit of a conflict even now of traditional anthropology versus applied anthropology, where applied anthropology is so often accused of being uh, unethical, um, you know, and some, somehow it's more unethical than the traditional field research, even though the traditional field research was used for all kinds of nefarious purposes just as often as applied anthropology. So, um, yeah, if, if you think, uh, if you think applied anthropology is the only part of the, the discipline that has, uh, ethical issues and ethical problems, spend 15 minutes on academic Twitter, uh, and <laughs> it will not take you long to find, uh, ethical gaps everywhere. Um, you know, there was this one really great discussion in one of your books, and forgive me, I forget which one it was, um, but uh, you mentioned the 1951 Yale report, which pitted Yale historians against CIA intelligence. So, so you can, and so, and I just want to use this one uh, line that you said, uh, the evidence of the power of open intelligence. What does that mean? Yeah, so I yeah I love that study too. I, I first read about that in uh, this this great book called Cloak and Gown, which is it's probably from the eighties. Um, I'm forgetting the the historian's first name, but it's 
winks and it it, it talks about this intersection uh, between academia and intelligence agencies uh, kind of starting in the Second World War with the OSS and stuff, uh, and then the early days of the CIA, where, you know, Yale was this real nexus, where, uh, you know, a lot of the best analysts uh, for the OSS and early CIA um, came out of Yale and Harvard and, the you know, the usual fancy pants schools and things like that. But the interesting thing is some of the best people they had weren't even from the social sciences. Uh, they were literary scholars, um, you know, poets, uh, people uh, who were used to thinking abstractly and symbolically and, and all of these sorts of things. So there's this, yeah, there's this early challenge that the year escapes me, but uh, it's, it's early CIA uh, where uh, there's a challenge, there's a benchmark of, I don't remember, three or five, something like this, uh, predictions about what's going to happen. And there are things like, what will uh, grain production be in, you know, in the Soviet Union, in the Urals and, and uh, Ukraine? You know, what, what will it be a year and a half from now? Um, what will this, this, and this? And so they have the agency, the CIA, which uh, you know, has its own incredible library. Uh, it has very smart people working for it, and it has secret agents and stuff out there. Uh, you know, it, it has access to secret Soviet documents and, and things like that. So it's it's spy versus scholar rather than spy versus spy. And they set up this this contest and they they say, all right, on your marks, get set, go. And this small group at Yale um, uses the Yale library system and their own smarts and their own resources. And this is all open source intelligence. And open source intelligence just means anything that you and I can get a hold of, basically. Uh, the, today it means Google and encyclopedias and books and you know newspapers and all these things. Uh, in the pre-Google era, era uh, you know, it was a it was a different world in terms of accessing things, but libraries are are powerful things especially we have scholars who can read different languages and a, a library system like Yale's where they have foreign magazines and newspapers and things like that. Uh, and, you know, in the end, uh, the, the, the proof was in the pudding and the, the Yale scholars did better uh, or arguably as well as the CIA did in terms of uh, making these sorts of, sorts of predictions. And this, this study, um, is often uh, brought up uh, in the, the context of this sort of bullshit factor of what, what happens when things are classified, right? Things that are classified often take on their own sacredness and that they have a greater value and things like that. And th there have been lots of studies looking at, you know, what's going on with classification. And, uh, you know, easily a third of the time, people are using classification to hide screw ups. Uh, that are that are going on, or or hiding activities they shouldn't be engaging in, and 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 things like that. And I've certainly found that in in a lot of the documents I've I've had uh, declassified. That a lot of a lot of times I've found that there are things that are are not initially released, and then I do appeals and get them released, and there'll be illegal activity by the FBI. They'll be breaking into someone's house or or something like that to get get information. Yeah, I mean, I, and then in your new, you you were kind enough to send me that sample chapter of your new book, uh, you know, specifically on American surveillance, and you know, the, the one of the chapters you gave me um, included, you know, J. Edgar Hoover and all the the stuff he did behind the scenes and how he was just really, man, he was a piece of work when you actually read about who he was and the things he did, and you know him. Him basically having something ghost written, and then you know forcing his agents to push his own war, his own book for sales, and all kinds of really corrupt stuff going on, right? So, um, but speaking about uh, you know you know military and intelligence and all this stuff, uh, let's talk a little bit about the human terrain system because that was a feature of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and relatively fresh. Uh, and, you know, a, a quick thing is that, you know, for people who are watching who don't know, the human terrain system uh, was intentionally, uh, you know, was this idea that somehow you could use social science to win the hearts and minds uh, of insurgents 
uh, and or the just the local population and culture so as to better kind of, you know, run what they call non-kinetic engagements, right? So the idea of this kind of loss of life and, and, you know, we were talking really briefly before we got on live here about how it's kind of like this ultimate white savior complex, this idea that you dangle a whole bunch of money in front of an anthropologist or a sociologist and you say, hey, you know what, not only is the pay really good, but you can save lives. You can go out into the field and save lives with with your scientific knowledge. So so let's so, so uh, just tell me a little bit about your uh, research and perspective on the human terrain system. Yeah, the, the human terrain system uh, was was a program that you know that was run through private contractors. Uh, that the dream of human terrain is that you would have culturally knowledgeable uh, anthropologists. They they had a hard time hiring anthropologists, but you would have scholars who had linguistic and cultural knowledge in wherever the theater of operation was. Could be Afghanistan, Iraq, or you know whatever's next. Um, that you would embed these teams with troops and they would go downrange. And the the public pitch for this is that they would, quote, decrease lethality. So they would, using cultural understanding, uh, rather than everybody, you know, going into a village, guns ablazing, uh, you would have somebody there who could say, look, this looks like a threatening situation, but think about it. You know, we're rolling in here with these armored vehicles and let's take it down a notch and this and this and this. And then, and this showed up in, uh, there, there, there was a training manual that got sent to WikiLeaks. There were a lot of disgruntled employees. So documents started to flow. Uh, I started getting contacted by people and you know who were sending me things that were in there about how much it had, it had gone off the rails. But, but there was really this pitch that uh, the human terrain squad leader would be able to uh, identify which groups were friendly and which ones weren't, which is targeting uh, when you when you get down to it in terms of what was going on. Um, it there was there was technology that was supposed to go with it that was supposed to work. The idea is that you'd have uh, anthropologists or a, so, a social scientist was the term uh, downrange that was embedded and that they would have of you know phones or radios you know communication devices where they could call and there would be these, these things called reach back centers that would be in Virginia or or wherever they were there was there was one in Virginia for a while where operators would be standing by uh, and they would have access to all sorts of documents to help you know provide this sort of instant knowledge uh, there were also these ridiculous uh, universal translator device the the phrasalator uh which looked like a like you know 1982 uh you know cell phone they were they're these, these huge these huge devices that uh you know or they look like a i don't know maybe 1990s doctor who prop or something like that uh that were supposed to do instant sort of translations uh and those like were Google, right <laughs> If only they had the Google translating engine, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there was all this technology, there was all this hype that went with it. Uh, and, you know, by the time it was done, there were serious financial irregularities. A whole bunch of money disappeared from it. It did not meet the goals as advertised. Uh, there were very serious critics uh, like myself who, I mean, it's not, difficult to figure out I'm not going to like a program like this but there were lots of people on the inside in the military who said uh you know first of all we're reinventing the wheel wrong because there are things like obviously cultural affairs officers who who do uh sensitivity and things and aren't trying to do this sort of nonsense on the fly uh that that are that are out there so um, it, it was a disaster. Uh, it I can't remember what year it finally died, but once it once it was done, um, by best estimates, certainly by my estimate, it was the most expensive social science uh, anthropological maybe project ever. Um, you know, coming up over seven hundred million dollars. You know, getting close to three quarters wow. of a billion dollars with not much to show for it. Um, and you know, parts of it though still survive. It, it migrated out into into different sort of programs. But 
during the during the early days of the the terror wars or the war on terror or whatever we're calling it, um, this was this was part of uh, General Petraeus's public um, propaganda campaign uh, for the American public with his new counterinsurgency manual and this idea that we would fight this smart war. Um, you know, in this in this obviously losing battle, we'll just say in Afghanistan, uh, where where the, this counterinsurgency strategy, uh, this this was kind of this public showroom for how we were going to be doing these sorts of things. Yeah, you know, and it, it I, I know you reading your books, too. You talked about how the the biggest the biggest issue is not just that you know because obviously a lot of anthropologists who go into it might have good intentions and all this stuff but but there's such an arrogant assumption that the military will listen and and I'm I'm kind of you know it, it kind of goes back to that old Maslow quote right that Maslow who gave us the hierarchies if all you ever have is a hammer uh, then all you'll see is nails right and so you got this kind of very militaristic perspective on on you know counterinsurgency and combat. And you see other anthropologists, for example, um, like Nasser Abu Farah, who wrote the really wonderful and kind of mind-blowing book, uh, The Making of a Human Bomb. You know, and, and right here, here it is. He's giving you all the data, all the evidence, all the historical context of what's going on in the Palestine-Israel conflict and why people choose to strap on a bomb and run into a civilian population. And, like, the answer is simply, you know, these counterinsurgency efforts. You know, all of the drone bombings, the, the, the constant harassment of the people, uh, you know, and it, it has so much overlap. Um, a lot of these things with the experiences of the indigenous people here, like the United States, for example. And if you look at the language uh, that was used uh, on Native Americans and indigenous people uh, by Americans in, you know, the, the 18th and 19th century, you see a lot of overlap to how we talk about these other populations uh, and how they're, they're essentially treated. And so, you know, it's just... It, it's really interesting, and, and you know, I didn't realize until reading your book, Weaponizing Anthropology, just how much of a crazy, really clown show the whole human terrain system really was. I mean, it was just, it was just this wacky program. And then, what was it? The chapter three of the the human terrain man, manual. You spent a whole chapter on that because, like, it just all it does is just plagiarize old, out of date anthropology. That doesn't even have in some, even stuff that is relevant still, but a lot of it, you know, drawing on things like the culture and personality school, which has been long abandoned by the the field of anthropology. It, it, it's just like it's as if so they took someone who was, you know, who's they had maybe an associate's degree in anthropology and said, hey, um, go and uh, you know uh, find a, a way to copy and paste all of these different ideas from anthropology and put it in a report because. Just the, you have several pages of the um, of the plagiarized context, and just reading that, it's like, whoa! Whoever wrote this doesn't even know how to really write, even so, let alone let alone uh, actually what anthropology is. Yeah, there's there's elements of human terrain that appear to me to simply be I don't know what else to call it other than a con job. Um, it was telling the military what they wanted to hear. The you know the military smart. They realized there's something else going on here. There's a different culture. Uh, there, there's all of this stuff, and you know, in 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 ways organizations think. This is not just the military. I work in a bureaucracy. Bureaucracies think in certain sorts of ways. Uh, they often want this piece to go somewhere to fill this. Oh, we have this issue. Let's do it. Let's make a committee. Let's do a piece that will fit here. And uh, I, I, I worked on on this committee for three or four years in the American Anthro Association, where we were when this is right after, you know, the years after 9-11, when there started being all these calls for anthropologists to work for military and intelligence agencies. And I served on this committee with I think seven other people. I'm never good at counting. Uh, Seven-ish other people. Uh, and one of them was, was Rob Albro, who at one point said this really great thing where he said, oh, what the military is doing is they want a culture piece. Okay. And to fit into their, to fit in their machinery. And that's what human terrain became. Or that's what the parts of the counterinsurgency manual came. It's like, oh, we have a bureaucracy. We need this thing. We're just going to plug this in here to help deal with this. 
uh, when cultural issues aren't something we know that you can just like say, well, we'll just throw a little bit more knowledge at this and, and this will take care of it. Yeah. You talk about how are you making a, a suicide bomber? It's like, you're not just going to throw some culture piece at that. Uh, there's a whole system in place here that's that are creating these sorts of conditions. And so human terrain was this thing that came along and said things that I certainly did not find to be true about culture, or that if you went in and engaged with the right people in a village that you're occupying, that suddenly people are are going to welcome you as liberators or, or something like this, uh, to quote our president. Uh, you know, it, it it was telling it was telling the military something it wanted to hear, and there again, there were really interesting people within the military. There's this guy uh, Ben Conable. Uh, I, I I'm bad at ranks. I think he was a colonel uh, who wrote these incredible pieces against human terrain, saying um, this is not going to work. And it's not like he and I are on the same team. In fact, he would sort of take snipes at me and I would snipe at him and, you know, back and forth on these things. But there were elements of our critique about how this would be impossible uh, to work, where there was a lot of a lot of overlap. Yeah. And, you know, and this is, gets back to something just generally in anthropology that I always bring up in classes. Humans like definitions, humans like models. But really what humans like is little boxes, little neat boxes. They can put things in and categorize them and they're safe and warm and cozy. But the reality of the situation is the world is complicated and messy and difficult to understand. And all you can really say is this is a trend. You can't you can't say anything is this is what a culture does, right? The whole culture model, the whole the culture of X has been essentially abandoned by anthropology because we understand that people have agency and complexity and, uh, you know, and, and they move beyond these uh, kinds of, you know, I, I mean, so you even think about the United States and you look at the, the protests leading up to the Iraq war or. Uh, the protest right now in Russia, uh, you know, these people who are protesting what Putin is doing or, you know, the, a people is not their government. A military is not their government. And so, you know, when you're trying to try to model and create this one size fits all scenario, it, you, I mean, you only need to look about look back at the Native American policies uh, that the BIA put in place the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to realize that their their number one problem was trying to take a huge region with a diverse group of different cultures, first of all, and then trying to assume that somehow everyone would agree that this was a good thing. Like, you know, for example, um, for all, you know, all the, 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 the things it did, like stopping the Dawes Act, the Indian Reorganization Act is a great example, right? It was this idea uh, that you could somehow revamp the reservations to, to fix the, the problems that popped up in the, the Miriam Report of 1928 and, and all this other stuff. And it's just like, it's just, we, we just want things to be so simple. We, we want things to, to make sense. And, and, you know, humans are messy. We, we don't always make sense. But but and and that's that's a I think that's a very important point. And one of the ways the military dealt with this were these cultural sensitivity classes, where it's like, you know, there won't be a problem with the occupation if you don't touch people with your left hand or show them the bottom of your shoe, as if these people are idiots. Are and and their issue is you know that there's an outsider who has different customs. Not that they're sitting in their village occupying it uh and and this is sort of the piece that human terrain and the counterinsurgency manual is supposed to take up it's like well if we do if we're more polite in our occupation we'll we'll have less problems and and, and of course part of that is true uh, but that doesn't erase the fact that it is an occupation that's going on which is the fundamental issue and the historical fact uh that uh winning a war through counterinsurgency, or, or I'm sorry, uh, through, yeah, through counterinsurgency, um, the historical examples of people doing this, uh, certainly in short periods of time, no, um, you can make, you know, people make historical arguments that in Malaysia, the, you know, the British were able to do this and so on, maybe, you know, Alexander the Great 
was pretty good at doing it because he left troops behind and became part of the culture and stayed there for years and years and years. And, and you know, like the, Tol- the Ptolemies in Egypt, they cynically right. merged Greek, uh, you know, religion with the, the local religion and, and things like that. Um, you know, Petraeus, it's interesting because there were some of the counterinsurgent doctrine people talking to Petraeus that would say, this is going to take 20 years. And of course, no one wanted to hear that. And it did take 20 years and it didn't work. Um, So the counterinsurgency mess really wanted to lean on anthropology. uh, And that's not new. Just weren't very willing. Some were, uh, you know, were mostly not very willing to get involved in it for political, ethical, and I think, um, I don't know, academic, like knowing it's not going to work, sort of reasons. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, in the interest of time, I, I want to switch away from the human terrain and talk about your newer book um, because it, you know, while it's a different topic, it certainly approaches a lot of things about state apparatuses of power and all apparatus of power and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, uh, I want to pull quotes from one of the early chapters of your book, the American surveillance state. Uh, and you said where you say my own engagement with the historical research changed me. It changed my understanding of surveillance systems of citizens, citizenry subjected to the scrutiny and heightened my understanding of the limited of how limited American freedoms are. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, so a long time ago, let's, I don't know, over getting closer to 30 years than not, um, I just started doing Freedom of Information Act research. Uh, I had a longstanding interest in the history of anthropology. Uh, my, my own trajectory is I started off in archaeology, um, got a little bit interested in the, the history of anthropology, did some work on that, then went back to cultural anthropology, did uh, learned Arabic, uh, did did doctoral field work living in Egypt, uh, came back to the States, uh, early 90s, and I didn't think I was going to get a job uh, and decided, well, under those conditions, um, I should work on a project that people said I, I shouldn't do it because it would be <laughs> impossible to get a job after doing it. Somebody, a, a famous anthropologist, said when he heard what I wanted to do, said, well, the idea is to publish uh, you know, publish or perish, not publish and perish, you know, writing about, about engagements between anthropologists and so on. So I, I just started doing Freedom of Information Act requests, and I didn't know what I was doing when I started. Um, uh, first, first one I ever did, I think, was on Leslie White, uh, because I'd heard he'd been a socialist. I wanted to see if the FBI had anything. And I, I just wrote, dear FBI, I read, I read some article in Rolling Stone that that said, oh, there's this thing, the Freedom of Information Act. And so I just wrote this letter. It's like, dear FBI, please send me anthropologist Leslie White's uh, FBI file. And they wrote back and said, well, uh, that isn't how it works. There's this thing called the Privacy Act that, that, that that's a good thing that says, I can't get your file, you can't get mine if, if one exists, um, until we're dead. And uh, with when we die, our privacy right dies with us, which is important. If it didn't, um, you know, the estates of dead people could sue us for slander and things like that. That, that can happen. I mean, there, there are lots of really good legal. They tell me there's good legal reasons for this. But it does make it possible that when someone dies, um, you can ask for make a Freedom of Information Act request for their for their file. So, um, you know, after this first failure, I included in it, they said you have to include an obituary or some other proof of death or if someone was born over 100 years ago there's a presumption they're dead you don't you don't need to send that so i learned by trial and error of, of doing these things and i just read uh i made an index of the american anthropologist obituaries and i read every obituary and anybody in there that I thought had done something in World War II that sounded interesting or may have, what, whatever. I just needed just a little sniff. I would just write a letter and send it off. And, and I did hundreds of these. Um, it was just, but you know, I had a form letter. It doesn't really take much time. Um, print them out, send them off, send them off. And then stuff started coming in. 
And the first book I did on this, I didn't even know any of this stuff existed. I found it was all McCarthyism. I started getting files of all of these anthropologists were under surveillance because um, well, some of them were socialists or, or Marxists, uh, not, not that many. Um, they were mostly activists for racial equality because they were taking like Boazian notions of race, that it's a social construct that's out there. And before it was cool to do so, um, meaning the 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, were going and doing protests, organizing people, trying to get rid of redlining, uh, showing up at school board meetings, doing public education. And if you did that during that time, you were a communist, uh, was the assumption of the FBI. So they were, uh, because, of course, at that time, it's not like the Democrats were uh, the, you know, a party uh, that was that was looking for racial equality and, and things like that. So um, at, at any rate, uh, doing this work, I just, you know, I'm just getting tens of thousands of these uh, pages of these files uh, coming in. And it just made me really think differently about activism. It made me think different uh, uh, about surveillance. It made me think really differently uh, about our government and and how it has continually monitored people who are pushing for change, which is, you know, sort of what led up to this book. Uh, this book is really the culmination of these hundreds and hundreds of FBI, some CIA and other agency files that I've gotten, um, where it's different case studies of everyone from American intellectuals that start getting involved in things like critiquing the nuclear program during the 50s and 60s, uh, journalists that are pushing back against official stories that are that are being told by the government and getting their FBI files and trying to piece together how it is that we have this government, that if you start doing these critical sorts of things, um, you you start getting a file, if nothing else, uh, and there starts to be sort of monitoring of your work. And sometimes, uh, certainly during the McCarthy period and so on, uh, there's harassment that that comes out of this or or opportunities that are not available to you that come out of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, do you think do you think we have a file now for this conversation? <laughs> you know, it's me. Uh, uh, I. Uh, rather than I, I know people who've started down doing this sort of work and they they pull back, they get a little freaked out and so on. And my thing is like, I don't care. Uh, I'm I am pretty much an open book uh, on 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 these sorts of things. And if someone wants to spend time uh, monitoring this and so on, maybe they'll learn something. There's that that great German film, the the lives of others that that tells this this cool story of uh, in East Germany when Stasi was monitoring everyone. I mean, it was this horrible, horrible system. And you watch these Stasi agents that are uh, listening in on the lives of, of uh, the private lives of these dissidents and they start being transformed by doing this. So maybe that's my hope uh, if, someone's, if someone's watching this, uh, that they learn something. Yeah, I mean that's the whole point, right? We are here to they're here to kind of teach and talk about this stuff. So I have one last question before we move to to more general questions. So for anyone out there watching, if you'd like to go ahead and type in your question in the chat box, uh, and uh, you know when we finish this this last next section here, we'll, we'll uh, uh, field your questions as well. Um, so um, so I'm really. You know, while I'm really wary of governments, I I currently feel a little more concerned myself uh, for corporate entities uh, who apparent who have unprecedented access to our lives with social media and the internet and our cell phones and everything. I mean, no doubt there's all kinds of like psychological profiles for sale on the market for, for marketing purposes. And while a huge portion of it may simply be for marketing project products. Um, you know, uh, how does corporate spying for economic purposes relate to government entities and government surveillance? Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think in some sense we've we've crossed a threshold where uh, the amount of corporate 
I don't know, spying, you know, profiling data uh, that's out there, which when needed, of course, can be accessed by the state through court orders and things like that in terms of tracking someone's movement with credit cards or, you know, frequent flying cards, uh, thing, you know, things like that. Uh, there's definitely lots of instances of, of, of that happening. But yeah, uh, you know, 25 years ago, there were there were discussions uh, that I think went the wrong way uh, in Congress about rights of privacy, about rights of being profiled. And of course, now a significant part of the economic model here in the country is that we are all these data points that are that are out there uh, and all of the free things that we access on apps and uh, the web are, are profiling us in 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 ways that uh, you know we know from the Snowden leaks and things like that are actually very similar to the ways that the the CIA are doing it uh, with I think probably higher levels of manipulation uh, trying to shape our buying habits and things like that that going on so yeah that's a that's a huge part of the brave new world uh, that that we're in and it is something that can be controlled I think we're heading in the opposite way of of controlling it and it's it's a threat to our privacy it's a, a threat to our freedom yeah I, I read somewhere um I, somewhere a while back that like there's these services that you can purchase if you're an employer that essentially will pull social media profiles and everything uh and and profile the kind of personality and qualities of this person and if they'd be a good employee or a bad employee it's just like just thinking of all the dystopian sci-fi I've read over the years, and I'm just you know my unalterity reports. It's very, it's very uh, Philip K. Dickian, as it were. <laughs> oh, and the, the the stuff that's that's going on in China now is is you know it's it's out of Black Mirror or something, right? Where you're you're having people's uh, public access scores uh, removing them from certain services that are out there, so. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of dystopian stuff. I assume this is heading towards. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, well let's open up to questions. Uh, we don't have any questions posted at the moment, and I, of course I always have. I have I have a long list of questions <laughs> for you anyway. So if we don't get any questions with the audience, that's totally fine. We'll uh, uh, we'll continue on, but I'll, I'll give people just a second here. Uh, and while I, while we're waiting for questions, the the one thing I want to ask you is. Um, so of all of the research and things that you've done in your career, what do you think is most important for the general population to know? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. What's the most important? You know, I here, yeah, I think, so this comes from, the unexpected book I did on McCarthyism. I didn't. I didn't know any of this stuff was out there, uh, and that's that. There were so many anthropologists, and this isn't just anthropologists. This is just the tribe I was looking at. Right? You could be a physicist or uh, whatever. The all you know, any discipline out there has stories like this. But because the anthropology was so engaged with critiquing race. Uh, they were front and center. I think the important thing I learned there is that activism matters. There were real live Marxists uh, who were out there that were not involved in activism, and the FBI didn't give a shit uh, because they were writing boring, jargony um, articles about Marxism for other people. But if you were somebody like Melville Jacobs, who was this anthropologist at the University of Washington, they got hauled before tribunals uh, that tried to take away his tenure and things. Um, and you were doing things like uh, going and talking to garden clubs and rotary and public groups and having a, a, a ongoing column in the Seattle newspaper and radio shows where you talked about race and you talked about racism and the, you know, these things. That's what lit the fire, uh, fire under him. Uh, and he got into all sorts of trouble because he was doing that. So activism matters. Um, it's threatening. It can get you into trouble. But the reason why it can get you into trouble is because you're trying to change something, hopefully 
you're trying to change something that's messed up, you could be doing activism that's you know off the rails and 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 not doing it. But um, the the strength of that truth is something that I guess I knew beforehand. Uh, but these were just so many examples of people who were speaking out about a great wrong uh, that got the attention and the focus and the harassment of the FBI, who's essentially there in place to protect the system that's there. Uh, I hadn't I hadn't really expected that. And it's it's all kind of obvious. Uh, but I think the truth of it is, to me, very powerful. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's even more powerful when you consider the fact that, you know, the concept of race is a class based power level. I mean, it's you know, it's created in the, the aftermath of Bacon's Rebellion and for the modern concept of American race. And it's used to divide and conquer the poor. And and um, and so you can see, you know, and if you look at the things that got, uh, you know, Martin Luther King and, and his contemporaries in the most trouble was critiquing the, the capitalist system, not necessarily the, the racist structure, you know, the, that that did too. But it was it was the real trouble came when they were critiquing capitalism in itself. And it's 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 really crazy because it's it's like we can't even it's most people are not even asking to rid capitalism they're just critiquing the the very disgusting elements of the system and saying hey we need to fix these things so less people suffer it's it's just you know and, and just reading you know the, the work you have the or the sample chapters you sent over you know a lot of what a lot of what it was to do is to protect like private business that a lot of the surveillance had less to do with you know, it seems to me, in my interpretation, it had less to do with American security and safety uh, and more to do with protecting, you know, American business interests. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the, there's this uh, Phil, Philip Ag, who was a CIA officer uh, who became disgusted with the, the agency in the early 70s and wrote a very important book where he named who all these agents were and things uh, for the CIA. I mean, he has this quote uh, where he says they are the you know secret police of American capitalism, you know, running around the world, plugging up holes in the dam, or thing you know things like this, uh, you yeah, know, which is very, I suppose, it's strident or something like that. But it also happens to be true in terms of what the functional role is uh, of of the CIA and domestically, the FBI long has had uh, this this sort of this sort of role. Uh, yeah, and. Um... You know, uh, so, you know, also reading your work, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that a lot of this stuff, the the intelligence stuff, a lot of the Cold War anthropology, uh, a lot of the surveillance, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a shallow, bastardized attempt at doing social science. Would you would you say that's a fair kind of uh, approach? Or, or interpretation? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. There's certainly social science techniques uh, that that they use. Uh, the thing that I would say is missing would be some sort of, uh, I don't know, honest open inquiry uh, sort of thing. I, that's prob that's probably not fair to say because there are lots of investigations where they are really simply trying to find out. But uh, the paranoia of the the FBI is is incredible. Um, so many of the files I've gotten. Uh, they'll be, you know, they'll, the reason for opening the investigation might be uh, that someone is, uh, let's say, applying for a wartime uh, position that, that needs a security clearance. And so they go and they interview neighbors and things like that. And, you know, that's appropriate if you want to find somebody uh, doing this. You, you do these investigations. But then what happens is they go to the neighbor's house and they say, uh, can you this this person is applying for a secure uh, position in the military uh, or, or intelligence apparatus? Uh, can we interview? Yeah, they, they go into the house. Well, then they start looking at the books that are in the people's house where they're they're doing this. They start profiling them and then they start opening up these sort of investigations that are that are there. One of the one of the chapters I, I have in the, the new book is about this system. I had no idea existed and there's um, I'm forgetting what it's called right now, but there's a something in place where for federal trials, so it has to be a federal case for the jury selection, the the prosecuting attorney can request that the FBI 
um, send them files on any prospective jurors. Now, the defense attorney doesn't get to see this. And the shocking thing is how many files they already have. So uh, this doesn't happen in every federal case, but high profile cases. Um, I started getting a bunch of files and, and looking at this, and it's extraordinary the sort of stuff they have sitting around. And so uh, it, this is an example of there'll be things like, well, yeah, we know a little bit about this guy. He works as an air conditioner repair person in the Bronx. Um, but we also happen to know he subscribes to this magazine, a labor magazine here. And when we did a background check, uh, when we're inside his house, we notice he had these sorts of books. So you might not want to have them uh, in there, which, you know, in a world of Google, that's sort of small, you know, oh, whatever. Uh, and of course, everybody, you know, for, for jury selection, they do Google people and things like that. But this apparatus that's out there. Um, I, I found sort of startling uh, to, to see that this has long existed. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine. I know I'm I'm very visible on Google. So, so, you know, anyone wants to find me, any of my students or anything. I've had numerous students come up to me like, oh, I Googled your name. There's a lot of stuff out there on you. I was like, well, yeah, and I'm visible. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on you, too. You just don't realize it's visible. You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's yeah. like whether or not you hide it or you think you're secure, it doesn't matter. It all it all ultimately, you know, comes back to you. So. Uh, we do have a question, uh, Sierra Kube, or Kube, as, apologies if I mispronounced that. What are your thoughts surrounding decolonizing anthropology to be able to legitimate other knowledge systems such as indigenous ecological knowledge? So, so how does that fit into all this? Oh, I think it's, I think it's all part and parcel. I mean, I, th I think that uh, the sort of power relationships in, in looking at intelligence agencies and anthropologists working with them, um, I think, I think are, should be all part of the same sort of project. Uh, I'm very supportive of all efforts to try and decolonize anthropology and look at how ethnography, how the history of the discipline fits into these larger sort of, uh, larger sort of power structures that are, that are out there. So, um, I like to think that I'm working on part of that project uh, historically, looking looking at these sorts looking at these sorts of issues. I, I hope that answered your your question. Yeah, you know, and another thing I would add is that um, I occasionally, when I'm teaching class, assign an article called uh, "The Egg and the Sperm," and it's by uh, Emily Martin, and maybe you're familiar with it, but it's it's really a critique on. Uh, gender bias and how science uses, you know, of course, just because it use culturally bound metaphors uh, when it's talking about the egg and the sperm and, you know, sleeping beauty is the egg and the prince comes to wake him up, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. And it, it you know, with the whole decolonization thing, not doing it is just bad science. It, it's just if you're not acknowledging the complexities of the power dynamics in which you're enmeshed and you're a social scientist who's studying social phenomena and you don't acknowledge your own limitations or the limitations of your funders or the limitations or ethics of, of just even being there, if you're not acknowledging those things, how can you honestly say you're doing good science? And you're, I mean, you can't be objective totally, but you got to at least try. You got to at least try to kind of hold yourself accountable. And, th and that can be extremely uh, difficult, of course, but it, it's the necessary kind of work. And, you know, and I think a lot of these, a lot of social sciences, but really science in general, uh, you know, who aren't doing the decolonization are just kind of dropping the ball because we know so much more now about how bias impacts, especially implicit bias, impacts our interpretation analysis. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think we're at a, a point where it has to be part of the project. Yeah. Well, uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions and, and we just have, we're just about out of time. Uh, is there any other final things you'd like to, to say about your work or, or anything? No, other than it's been a pleasure. Um, keep up the good work. I hope to talk again. All right. Well, maybe we'll have you back on later after your uh, next book comes out or when you got another project going. Thank you so much, 
uh, David. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, you know, if you uh, haven't had a chance to check out David Price's books, I highly, highly recommend them. There's a, a link to his uh, series of books on Amazon in the description down below. Uh, you know, uh, even if you don't agree with anything he's saying or anything we're talking about here, it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile thing to consider these perspectives, uh, you know, as uh, opposed to some of the dominant narratives that we get from, you know, intelligence communities or ma mainstream media or various other things. So, uh, you know, it's always important to consider a wide variety of perspectives in these things. So uh, thanks so much for, ha for coming on, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Michael.